is going to do this week. Well, starting today, but uh, Vacation Bible, swing, Bible School is in full swing, and we also have, uh, good Lord, 55, 57 people at Forward Conference that will be coming back today, so keep them in your prayers. And, um, but hey, we have built a house in Guatemala every year for the last seven or eight years. I think this was our seventh house. But I just want to just throw you some pictures as I talk just a little bit, and they'll scroll these. Some of the progress back in 2000, I can't remember, 11 or 12 or something, they had a terrible uh, earthquake, and it destroyed 16 pastors' homes. And I have a friend of mine that was my supervising pastor back in 87. He's a missionary, and he challenged me. He said, Pastor, instead of coming and just preaching, why don't you try to build a house? Now, you, this was years ago when we were just fixing to start. There's the beautiful tile. That's how they finish it out. Uh, and anyway, I took the challenge to go, and, and you went with me, and many, or 12 of you did. And we built that house, or the first house, and God just did it a miraculous thing. So we have a heart for missions, and we spend a lot of money outside the walls of our church to the tune of over $200,000 a year, um, that, and God places his hand on it and blesses it, but many of you have gone with us. This right here represents about a 700-square-foot house with a living room, two bedrooms, a kitchen, a bathroom. Um, and while we're down there, all we can do is basically get it dried in. In other words, we get the walls up, get the roof on it, um, and, you know, punch the holes for the plumbing and the wiring and all that. And then we leave with the shell. It takes them another couple of months, and they come in and do the floor They'll stucco the outside. They'll put in the beautiful doors, as you can see over to the right. They'll put in nice windows. And to their standard, that would be equivalent for me and you buying a house in the meadows or the lakes or, or, or something like that. And so, and this is one of the, the wonderful couples that we have built for. You can see the beautiful door, windows, and all that. And if you could imagine <clears throat> when they live in abject poverty, having to worry about where am I going to sleep, where am I going to house my family, and all of that. And for the, how many of you ever been? Let me see your hand if you've been with us to Guatemala. Let me see your hand. Rate them high real quick. One, two, three. Well, I guess everybody's in the next service. But anyway, three of you have. But, um, and, and I've been seven or eight times myself, and it is just an amazing deal. We normally get that thing dried in in about five days, and then they come in there, and finish it all out. It cost us about $11,000. Now, of course, it was about 10, five prior to COVID. It might be a little bit more than that now, you know, how everybody takes advantage of that. But anyway, um, nonetheless, that's what we've done. And I'm not here to raise no offering for it. I just wanted to bring you the pictures because you've given so much to, oh, by the way, I got a, an email from the Bishop of Africa, the church that you gave the first $10,000 to build in the Gambia, the nation on the west coast of Africa, is nearing completion. They've invited me to come back to be part of the dedication in September. The jury's out yet as to whether I'll go. But nonetheless, it is a beautiful, beautiful building there, the first church of God in Gambia, the entire nation of Gambia with more than 5 million people. So... Um, Anyway, so I just want to just bring that to you to just show you that the money you give to missions is making a difference. We're able to, to hand that off. And if you've ever been there on that last day, we're in Guatemala, and we hand that off to that pastor and his wife. Now, let me tell you something, ladies, you'll identify with this. Normally, my wife is with me, or Tara is there with Ken, or some of uh, the wives of staff members here. So they're going to take the pastor's wife, and they're going to shop for them, and they're going to make sure they got all the things for the kitchen they need in the house. And so not only do we do the house, we shower them with many, many blessings, and, uh, and, and you take care of that. I'll tell you one quick thing before we preach. Um, I was, in, in fact, it was the house that you saw with those tile floors right there. We built that um, for this pastor and uh, his wife. I preached for his, uh, at his church that day before I I can't remember if I saw the house first or what, but anyway, I preached for him. Great service, altars was full, and et cetera, et cetera. He calls me his pastor. He hugs me, and, 
You know, God has sent you from the United States to do what we couldn't do. So we, we built the house. As a matter of fact, I wasn't even, my, my mother-in-law passed, and so Kelly and I had to stay home, and Adam and Henry and them led the team. They went on, built the house. Kelly and I went back in February to dedicate it, and we was wondering why in the world have they not moved in? Uh, I, I was thinking that. I, I didn't say it, but I'm like, why have they not moved in? They said, well, his mother had been sick, and they'd been sort of, sort of trying to take care of her. But then uh, after going a little bit deeper with it, I, I got Pastor Frankie to talk with him, and he said the bottom line is they built that in San Cristobal, which is right here on a major highway of Guatemala. And the problem was this. Power came all the way to this side, and they needed to cross that highway. To cross that highway was going to be expensive, about $3,000 or so. And um, he said to Bishop, or he said to Pastor Frankie, he said, we just don't, it's going to take a while to save the money to get the power over here. And they were so proud of their little house, they took everybody to show them the, the indoor toilet and the indoor shower with hot water and all that, they were, but they couldn't live in it. And I asked him, I asked Frankie, I said, why? And so he talks to him in, in, in Spanish, and he says, that is a reason his mother has been sick, but the real, the biggest thing is they just don't have the money to pay for the power to come across the highway at San Cristobal. And so just that quick, the giving spirit that God said, I said, the harbor will pay for it on Monday. I'll be back home, and if Frankie will go ahead and front the money, or uh, we'll send the money. And we sent the money the next Monday, tears streaming down this pastor's face and his wife's face, and just love and embrace us. Can you imagine somebody handing you the keys to a house and saying, just go do ministry? Are you, just go do ministry. So anyway, thank you. Uh, can we give the Lord a big hand for the mission mind that we have? And let, let me just tell you something that you will never, ever, ever outgive God. And I, I say that corporately, but I say it personally to you. The more we try to hoard, I'm not saying that you don't need to have a budget and that you don't need to do some things like that. You do. But the more we try to hoard, the more that just flows through our fingers. We give more this past year than we have ever. We were the number one church in South Georgia giving to missions last year, and we somehow have more than we've ever had. Take in more than we had ever taken in. So God wants us to be a channel and not a reservoir. Are you with me? As long as we can keep the channel open and keep it flowing, he can get us what we need. Now, I know I, I'm speaking in faith myself because we need phase two, phase three. There's, there, there's a lot of things in my mind, but God's going to channel what he needs to us. So today I want to talk with you. The Lord would help me because, oh, by the way, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say anything about the decision of the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, and I know there's people on all, both sides of that argument, but as a church, we stand for life. We always have. We stand for life, and, and we love, and I know that I don't want to get into the weeds of it. I just want to say we have prayed for 50 years. And, and to me, I'll be honest with you, I, I really think if someone is a professing born-again Christian and cannot celebrate that ruling, you really, really need to take a deep look in the spiritual mirror of God's Word and ask, what is it about murder that I'm not understanding? Anyway, now I've set the table for me to preach through that, so uh, nonetheless, that's what I plan to do. Um, that, that's just my feeling. You don't have to agree with it, but the church's position is we believe in the sanctity of human life, period. All right. Now, someone might say, and I can't run down these weeds, but I got to real quick. Someone might say, well, what about all these orphaned children? Listen, eight of us rode across the state of Georgia from Alabama to Jekyll Island to raise $68,000 for orphans. We do care. We do care. We got people right now on our staff, two of which I know right off, that has adopted babies. And so, and we help every way we can. If somebody wants to try, try to place a a baby, you know, it shouldn't cost 40 grand to adopt a child. That's what my son Adam had to pay five years ago. It ought to be just, I mean, 
abortion was free. Well, well could we make adoption free? Or at least half price. Anyway, enough of that. Let's get to the Word of God. There'll be a time and place for that. I want you to know Satan has a plan or a plot for your life. You and I were born in the image of God, created in the image of God, and Satan wants to destroy every Christian, period. He hates God. He's always been jealous of God. That's why he got kicked out of heaven, because he said, I will ascend to the throne of God. I will sit in the sides of the north on God's throne. And God kicked him out of heaven with one-third of the angels that became demons. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. And so he hates God's, uh, God's creature, God's creation, and we are the pinnacle of God's creation. He rejoiced when God cursed the serpent and made him crawl on his belly all the days of his life. Satan rejoiced when he lied and deceived Eve and she took of the apple and gave it to Adam and he took of or the apple, the fruit. We don't know what it was, but it was some sort of fruit. Uh, Satan rejoiced when we were kicked out of God's presence and could not come back. He rejoiced when God cursed the earth and said, let thorns and thistles infest the ground. He rejoiced when God said to the man, now the earth will not yield its strength and you will till the ground the days of your life until you return to the earth from whence you came. And now we have to have fertilizer and 888 and 10, 10, 10 and all of that and ammonia nitrate and everything to get the ground to do what ordinarily it would have done. And the devil rejoiced because that benefit was taken from us. Ladies, it wasn't supposed to hurt to have babies. Y'all know that? He said, but now in conception and childbearing, you're going to bear the brunt and the pain and be reminded of the cost of sin. Anybody? Wait? I ain't lost y'all this early on, have I? But the plot of the devil is to destroy you. And today, I, I, let me just read a few things because I need to share it with you. Isaiah 54 and 17, uh, this would be our marquee scripture, if you will. It just says, and I want you to take this to heart, no weapon, somebody say it with me. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. I want to tell you, every born again Christian ought to be shouting right now. Because everybody that's a warrior on the social media platform, every tongue, let me go ahead and give you some modern day, or finger that rise against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So no weapon that is formed against you or me, the Bible says not one of those weapons is going to prosper. Now, there is some contingencies. We have to stay anchored in him. Are you with me? Yes. But that means none, not any. Uh, uh, whatever form, that, um, forged or fashioned or designed, every gossip, every lie, every word of slander, every evil word, none of that is going to get me. The Bible says in Proverbs 11 and 8, but... The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked comes in his stead. I want you to know the devil meant some things for your harm, but God just decided to use it as a training tool for you. You know, Joseph said to his brothers after 20 years of enslave, or well, uh, estrangement from them, he was now in Egypt. He said, you sold me to Egypt and you meant it for my harm, but God worked it for my good. Romans 8 and 28 tells us, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to God's purpose. So I want you to know that God takes all of the trials and everything that besets us and says, you know what, the devil throwed this stone at them to mess them up, but I'm going to use it as a training tool to make them stronger where they are. So today I want to give you, if I can, three tactics that the devil uses to destroy every born-again uh, child of God. Three tactics that he employs. And then I want to give you uh, some tenets, if I may, uh, 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 of God's plan for you. But the tactic of the devil is, number one, to isolate you. 
Are you with me? Uh, because in isolation, that means in remoteness, in loneliness, in separation, in seclusion. In fact, the Word of God tells us in Genesis chapter 2 that it is not good for man to be alone. That's why he created a woman. Are you with me? And so isolation, there is by separation. I, I mentioned a moment ago, Adam and Eve was taken out of the garden because of sin. And they could no longer be in the presence of God. Uh, before that, God would come and walk in the cool of the day through the garden with them. And, and, but the devil lied to them. And it was a tactic to get them separated from God, to get them isolated. And nobody be, could, could be in the presence of God for thousands of years until Jesus Christ died at Mount Calvary, taking the hand of God and the hand of man and bringing us back into a right relationship with him. Amen. Give him praise. So... <clears throat> Isaiah said that it is our sin that has separated us and our iniquities that have separated us from God. James says in chapter 1, we just did a series in James, he said that no one should say when they are tempted that God has tempted me because God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, he says. But every person is tempted when they are drawn away or dragged away by their own own evil desire and enticed. And then after that desire has conceived, it brings or gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Man, you're listening today. Thank you. So, um, so Adam and Eve were driven from the garden. Uh, the, the devil got his wish. And then I think about the prophet Elijah. It, you know, you could read in 1 Kings chapter 18, and we all want to be like an Elijah because he's a great prophet of God. And, you know, he stood on the Mount Carmel, and he, he said to the, the, the people of Baal, the worshipers of Baal, if you're God's God, why don't he answer by fire? That's what we'll do. We'll build an altar. So they built an altar, and they called on their God, Baal, for, for hours and hours from the morning all the way past lunch, all the way over to the afternoon. And Elijah finally said, okay, it's my time. I wish I had time to tell you all this. I mean, they had blood all over the altar because they cut themselves. They cut their babies, their children. They tried to get Baal to send fire down from heaven. It didn't work. They rebuilt the, the, the altar. They put the stones around it. They dug a trench around it. And they put 12 barrels of water on top of it because fire just don't ignite with water. Are you with me? Nobody used waterlogged wood to try to start a fire. Anybody with me? All right. Anyway, so Elijah then, he says, um, he begins to pray. And, and I'm not going to pray it out, but 63 words in prayer to God and fire from God fell out of heaven and consumed the sacrifice, the stones around the altar and licked up the water out of the trench. I believe he was convincing when he said, the God that answers by fire, he is God. Now, fast forward a day or two, uh, uh, Jezebel, the king's wife, Ahab, the wickedest king, wickedest king to ever rule Israel, stared up by his wicked wife, Jezebel. That's what the word says. She said, see if thy life is not like the life of one of these prophets of Baal about this time tomorrow. In other words, I'm coming to get you. And all of a sudden, the great prophet of God who called fire down from heaven with 63 words, he never asked God about anything. He just got in the flesh real quick and started running. You know where he ran to? He ran to Mount Horeb. That is called the Mount of God. He ran to where he had seen God last other than Mount Carmel. He got there, and then God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? But on his way there, he, 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 he just got exhausted. He leaned up beside a juniper tree, and he prayed this prayer, Oh God, I am no better than my father. Please take me now. I'm ready to die. Everyone has cursed you. They've torn down your altars. They have denied the faith, and they're about to kill me. And he prayed that prayer two or three times. And then he fell asleep beside a broom tree. And then God sent an angel, and an angel cooked some pancakes on a, a, a little makeshift grill and he had a jar of water and he said to Elijah, arise and eat. Watch this. 
for the journey is too great for thee. And here's what I want to tell you today. You might be, you might have had some exploits in your life and you've done some great things, but now you're running and you're tired. You're exhausted. God sent the angel again, said, wake him back up, give him another cake and tell him to arise and eat for the journey is too great for thee. Amen. And what I'm saying is it ain't, it ain't too great for God, but it's too great for thee. If you go without God, you are surely going to burn out. Did, did you know for the next 40 days, Elijah didn't eat a bite of food, but he, he called on God. When he got to Mount Horeb, God said, what are you doing here? He said, listen, I got 7,000 people on the other side of this grove that have never bowed their knee to Baal. They've never kissed his image. He said, get up. He said, you know, you're suffering right now. Well, what you think is isolation, if you will. But ain't nothing going to separate me from you. Are you with me? The tactic of the devil is to separate you, though. But Romans, Paul writes and says, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? Uh, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long, and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, he says. He says, but in all of these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, he says, nor life, nor angels, or demons, things present nor future, any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you and I, if we are in the faith, we cannot be isolated from the Lord. They done tried that. They banished the apostle John to the Isle of Patmos. He said, but I heard something behind me on the Lord's day, and I looked to see who it was, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. A sword came forth from him, and he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and yet I am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and of hell. They can try to separate you all they want to. Nothing can separate me. He walks right on through surgical doors. He walks right on through prison bars. He walks right on through dungeons. My God, he makes the cloud his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. Hey! He goes where he wants to. The word of the Lord said when the disciples were out in the middle of the sea and they thought they were isolated, he come walking to them on the water, defying gravity. Let me tell you something. He made the rules about gravity. He can suspend them if he wants to. I didn't say you could. You jump off this church tower, you probably did. You better make sure you are, you are in the spirit. But Jesus had a panoramic view. After he fed 5,000 that night, he sat on that edge of that mountain and watched those boys on the lake of Gennesaret, if you will, or the Sea of Galilee. And, he, and when they got in trouble, he said, it's time for me to go get them. And he just goes walking. They said, it is a spirit. He said, no, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter said, if it be thou, Lord, bid me come to thee on the water. He said, come. And Peter got out of the boat, and he began to walk to him on the water. What shall separate me from the love of God? No, because even in the midst of the sea, he'll come walking to me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the middle of a fire. The Bible said they was, they was not alone. He said, because the king looked down and said, didn't we throw three men in? Yes, O king. He said, I see four men unloosed, unbound, and walking around, and the fourth man looks like the Son of God. Now, I don't know how Nebuchadnezzar knew what Jesus looked like because he ain't been manifest yet. Are y'all with me? Say amen. He was still in heaven beside the Father, but he showed up in the middle of the fire. Let me ask you, what can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? The tactic of the enemy is isolation, but God says, you are never alone. I am with thee always, even unto the end. Hey, so God said this in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. Oh, let me back up. 1 Corinthians 15 and 55. See, because people think that death's going to separate us. Oh, no, because God gave us life. And the Bible says when we die, the Spirit returns to God. That gave, the ground, I mean, excuse me, the, the, the dust of this tabernacle returns to the earth from whence it came, and the Spirit returns to the God that gave it. Oh, let me show you. Man, he said, 
So grave, where's your victory? Death, where is your sting? Because Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Are you hearing me? So 2 Corinthians 5 and 1, for we know that if our earthly body of this tabernacle are dissolved, we have a building of God and a house that is not made with hands eternal in the heavens. See, to be absent from this body is to be present with our creator. So his plan, the devil's plan is isolation or his plot is isolation, but God's plan is that you'll never be where my grace can't keep you. Man, I got to hurry. David said, watch this. I I, I want y'all to get this. I'm going to read this scripture. You you just need to know it. Let me just read it. David said in Psalm 139 and 8, if I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Uh Uh-oh, now, in the light of the Supreme Court's decision, God just so made it to where this happened to be part of my message. I didn't plan it, but here it is. For you created me, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Are you hearing me? All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts to me. God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Woo! Now that moves me. I don't know about you. Jesus said, I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You see, it is no wonder that David would write, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He said, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Are you with me? You anoint my head with oil. Surely goodness, and you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't have to be isolated. That's the tactic of the devil, and I got to hurry. That is the tactic. You see, and the next one is this. I I want you to understand this. First of all, you are never alone. But catch this. The the first plot was, was, was isolation, but here's where it is today. Here's where we live. The next plot of the devil is if he can't get you isolated and get you to give up on God because of isolation, he'll say, I'll make you insolvent. That's a $2 word for broke. Are you with me? Now, I'm not talking about when you've already got, you know, you know $100,000 in the bank and you say, well, my budget is broke. No, 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 no. I'm talking about broke the way Mike sees broke. Uh-huh. When you are po, I'm talking about you can't even afford the O-R. You just po, not, not P-O-O-R. I used to work, I know, I, I worked at Po Folks. That was my first job in the name Fit. Y'all with me? So, so, but the devil says, if I can't get you isolated, I'll make you insolvent. I'll show you that your God is not God, that he's not the source. So, you know, and that's what he'll do. Job lost everything. I want you to understand something about this, and, and I try to move through this. Job was the richest man in all the East. He had plenty of cattle, herds, flocks, all that stuff. But the Bible says in chapter 1 and verse 2, there was born unto him seven sons, three daughters. His substance was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a very great household. That He was the greatest in all the east. And there came a time in verse 62 when the sons and daughters were eating together in the oldest brother's house, and a messenger came and said to Job, you know, they were eating, and the Bible said the house collapsed. But, but, but before that, uh, a messenger come to him and said, hey, Job, all of your cattle, what's this? He said, all of them are gone. He said, uh, all the donkeys, they're gone. They wiped them out. The Chaldeans got some. The Sabaeans got some. And, and, and in other words, in one breath, 3,000 camels are gone. 
Another bird, 500 donkeys gone. Another 500 of this, 1,000 of that, all of them's gone. And then lastly, that evening, someone came and said, Job, I, I really hate to tell you this, but, but your oldest brother threw a big party, and all of them were there, and a, and a great wind hit the four corners of the house, and the supports collapsed, and all your kids are dead. So now your money's gone. Your kids are dead. Are you, is anybody with me? Hey, listen, you can take all the animals. You can take all that. But please don't tell me all my kids are gone. You with me? I don't want one of them gone, but, but this is what happened to Job. And so the Bible says that Job got up. He tore his robe. He threw himself down with his face to the ground. And he said, naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked will I return. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. That's tough. I mean, that's fun to preach, but that's hard to live. Are you with me? That's tough, man. Uh, but, but, but so Job suffers isolation, and now he suffers insolvency because he had all kinds of money. He had all kinds of assets, and now all the assets are gone. His children are gone. His reputation is gone. But, but here's what Habakkuk said. Habakkuk said in 3 and 17, although the fig does not blossom, neither shall there be fruit of the vine. The labor of the olive shall fail. The fields yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. There shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I'll joy in the God of my salvation for the Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He's going to establish me. In other words, what he's saying is God is my provider. Some of you need to get out, grab the gas uh, nozzle, put it in your truck or car and just look right there at the pump and say, God is my provider. Are you with me? God is my provider. You bring your tithe to the house of God or you write your check or swipe your card. You go ahead and just, just symbolically look at, you know, at maybe at the floor telling the devil, God is my provider. God is my provider. Let me give you a real quick testimony. My friend, Benny Tate, pastors about 7,000 people um, uh, between here. I mean, it's uh, between uh, Atlanta and Macon. Uh, Griffin area, 15 minutes from there. Benny Tate, 85% of all their money came in the bucket every Sunday. Spirit-filled Methodist Church. I mean, 85%. And when the pandemic hit and they had to close the doors, they were running 5,000 people at the time. Staff of 30-some-odd people. They come to work scared to death, wondering what's going to happen. Benny said, I'm going to go pray. That was his habit. He would pray. Uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, hour, I don't know, in the morning. And I'll make a decision, and I'll come out, and I'll tell you what's going on. All of them in the hallway wondering, am I getting laid off today? Which one of us is going to go? And he come out of his office, and he said, uh, in a conference room, nobody's going to be laid off, and not one church that we support will we stop supporting. Not one missionary that we're giving to will we stop giving to. He turns to his executive pastor and says, Cameron, figure out a way to get us online giving right now, somehow. I want to tell you they've grown by 2,000 people since COVID started, and their money has, has just took off. Not one time did he back up. Here's what I'll tell you. I don't care what the economy looks like. I don't care what gas looks like. I don't care if groceries, what they look like. God is my provider. He is. I don't know how he does it. I'm not questioning how he does it. He just does it. And not one missionary, not one church did they cut, and their budget grew, and their numbers grew, despite what COVID did. Anyway, I got to go on. Man, time has... So, so the plot of the devil is for you to be insolvent. But God says, I want you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, will men give unto your bosom. He said, my God, this is Philippians 4, 19, shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. He said, yeah, I'll give you the desires of your heart when you delight yourself in me. He brought water from a rock and quail from the sea, bread from heaven and honey from the carcass of a lion. In one moment, he fed 5,000 people with one boy's lunch. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Somebody say amen. 
So I hope the economy gets better, but I'm going to be all right if it don't. You said, that's a mighty bold statement. Yep, I can speak in boldness because I know whose I am. I'm going to be just fine. I'm not going to miss no meals. And if I need to drive somewhere, I'm going to drive there. And if not, I got a good bike. Are you with me? But God's going to be with me. God's going to be with me. So the plot, now, now, now I, I need to hurry on. My last tactic. So his tactic was to isolate you. His tactic was to make you insolvent, make you broke, make you where you're going under. How can I? There's a lot more month at the end of the money. Some of y'all understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. You prioritize God first, and God's going to take care of you. Now, there are people that says, well, I, I tried that for a week or two. Let me tell you something. It is, you know, I'll use my dad because he ain't going to get after me. He gets about $1,400 $1, a month. You know, the first thing he's going to do, he's going to write his tithe check, and then he's going to add about $30 to it as an offering to his church. First check wrote. He still does the checks. And then he's going to send a check for $100 to the harbor. I said, Daddy, you can't be sending us. Hey, well, son, I feel led to do it. Well, Daddy, I feel led to send it back. So, I mean, I've... We've done that before, and I've gotten scolded or whatever. I'm just simply saying, he has faith that says, God's going to take care of me regardless. And God has, and God will, and he does. But the last plot, I want you to know, because uh, it fits right here so good. Not only does he want to make you isolated and feel like nobody loves you, nobody cares for you, you're way out there isolated. And by the way, that's the fastest way to backslide. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you want to call it, when you get out, you know, which, the animal the, the lion gets typically is the one that has fell back away from the group. They're easy prey. There's nobody there to help them. And, and so they get them. So, so isolation and then insolvency. The last one is, are you ready? The tactic of indifference. And boy, would that fit right now. Even for the last couple of years, the, the racial wars, the political wars, the Supreme Court, the keyboard warriors, you know, the women's lib, the this, that, and uh, these call themselves Christian but have, oh, yeah, it, indifference. Just leave it right there. The tactic of indifference, and I want to walk through this before we pray. Indifference is a lack of concern or empathy or coldness for others. Satan will do his best to drive a wedge between, not only between you and God, but between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, yeah, they're going to be a bit of a uh, ooh and an on right here for a second, but he's going to do his best between you and your brothers and sisters. He's going to incite indifference in any way he can. He, and you know, sometimes it comes through favor, favorability and uh, our favoritism and partiality. He'll do it through gossip. Gossip is, said, gossip is words that are said behind your back that somebody would never say to your face. The opposite is flattery. Flattery is when somebody says something to your face that would never say it behind your back. In other words, that new haircut looks so good on you. And then they turn around and say, there's a word for that person. It's a hypocrite. Right? I, hope, I hope that's not you, but if it is, if the shoe fits, get you some. That's a hypocrite. You don't flatter somebody to their face and then turn around and laugh at them behind your back. You have no integrity. Amen? You speak the truth in their face, and you speak the truth behind their back. So, but, but the devil would use flattery and gossip and criticism and innuendo and all of this to separate God's children from each other because he knows there is strength in unity. He knows if we link our faith together where two or three are gathered in my name and the more of us that are gathered and unified. Did you know there's so much power in unity? I can't remember the bridge. But 100 years ago, when an army marched across this bridge, they had to intentionally make them march out of step so that the one heel beat, come on, military guys, so that the one heel beat would not destroy. They said it would be too much on the bridge if they were all in unity and hit at the same time. Isn't that crazy? 
The devil knows there's power in unity. So he wants you indifferent. Um, so, and then there's slander. Um, the, then there, when people become indifferent, they are divided. And you know what? Divided, you fall always. Divided, you fall. United, you stand. So we have to stand. You know something? Now, I know we're never going to gr- agree on everything. We're not going to agree on everything. But let's, uh, let's major in some things. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. I think we can all agree on that. Born of the Virgin Mary. I mean, you know, there's some certain things that we can absolutely 100% agree on. You say, well, Pastor, what, 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 is, is there a gray area or somewhere? Well, yeah. And probably shouldn't go down here, but I am. Alcohol. I'm a teetotaler. I don't drink. Well, I do in NyQuil. Kelly says sometimes I get a little extra. She said, won't you just stop by and get a fifth of brandy or something? No. I'm... Here's what the Bible says. Be not drunk with wine. I, know, I, I can tell you about all the tenets, how nothing good ever comes from it, of alcohol. I, I can tell you. I'm just telling you. Read the Bible. Noah got drunk, got naked. Y'all with me? Um, so many things happened under the influence when they all got drunk in Israel. Uh, when they were, uh, when Moses went to pray on the mountain, he come back and they were worshiping a golden image against the commandments of God. So nothing ever good comes of it. Nothing. But that is a gray area. Someone says, well, how, how many can I have? I don't know how many you can have. I don't do none of it. Because I, I know where it took me years ago. So I'm, I'm just done. Um, but that, that's totally different. Jesus is the Son of God, period. There, there's no question about that. There ain't nothing gray about that. Thou shalt not kill. There ain't nothing gray about that. Now, I understand there are justifiable homicides. You walk in, someone's choking your wife and about to kill her. Yep, I, I get all that. And the Bible makes provision for all that. But, but let me move on. When we become indifferent, we become divided. The devil's plot is for you to be indifferent. But as much as life in you, here's what God said, live at peace with all men. That means gender neutral, not gender confused, but gender neutral. Live at peace with all women too, if you can. Solomon said it's better to dwell in the top of a rooftop, in the corner of the rooftop, than in the house with a brawling woman. That's what he said. But what, what, I guess when she gets through arguing, you come back down and as much as life in you live at peace. I, I need to go on. I shouldn't have opened that. But Here's what the word says. If a brother is overtaken in a fault, sin, you which are spiritual should restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering your own self, lest you fall. So if someone falls into sin, it's not my job and your job to beat them over the head and say, you ought to do better. And that, that might be a conversation. But we better be careful because you might be there next week. <clears throat> Consider yourself lest you fall. He says, now, now, here we go. This is going to be tough. If you have all against your brother, in other words, if there's some indifference, there's some coldness, leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with your brother and then come back. And you know why? Because God don't accept hypocritical worship. You can ooh and ah and have googly eyes for him all you want, but if you hate your brother, he don't accept your worship. Ooh, yeah. So 1 Corinthians says, 110, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord God Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing and that there's no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment, for it has been declared unto me, he's talking about the church at Corinth, he says, it's been declared to me, my brethren, by them of the household of Chloe, that there are some contentions among you. Let me tell you something, my friend. There is never a time when the church ought to have to go to the legal system of the world to settle a dispute. Did you know in the, in the Bible days, they listened to the church? That's right, they did. If they had a dispute, they came to the authorities at the church and they settled it and everybody accepted it. Nowadays, it's different. We go lawyer up, and we take an ecclesiastical matter and make it a legal matter. That's another message. You might better stand with me before 
I get too carried away. I've tried to show you today that Satan has a plot to take over your life. He wants to do it through isolating you. If he can't isolate you, he wants to make you insolvent to where, oh my God, I don't have nothing to live on. I'm never going to make it. If you can't do that, he wants to, to make you indifferent. You're bitter. You're cold. I quit my life group. I'm not even going to serve no more. And, and you're doing it to the damnation of yourself. You're the only one that gets hurt. It's kind of like, I remember being younger and stupid, getting mad and just haul off and punch a wall. Brothers, you don't got to raise your hand. I know some of y'all done it. And that's all cool if you, unless you find a stud. But if you find one of them studs, you're going to break something. Y'all hearing me? And uh, it won't be just sheetrock. That's right. So, so I, I'm just saying. But the devil wants to make you indifferent. He wants to make you indifferent. And, and he'll use more than one. If he can make you broke and indifferent. If he can make you uh, uh, isolated and broke. So let me say this. Um, strapped, so, so financially strapped. That's why I've encouraged people to try to get out of debt. So that don't let the devil just use, hold that over your head. Here's what I want to tell you before we pray. When the word of God said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Here's what he means. Close your eyes and think about this. No tactic, gossip, rumor, or accusation. On Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever. No past history, wherever that shows up. No revealed sins, no childhood wounds. No weapon of victimization or verbal abuse or vented anger. Or the weapon of a bad attitude or misguided spiritual guidance. The weapon of ignorance and evil looks and intimidation old buddies and old flames and old friends the weapon of old sins that haunt me and the newspaper articles that are still out there in the media exposure that will never go away old photographs old habits hang ups and old phone numbers no weapon of the mind no psychiatric label no emotion, no foul spirit, no diagnosis. Nothing formed against the child of God shall prosper. None of that shall prosper. Let me ask you this. If you're born again, child of God, let me see your hand right now. Come on. That means you. You can put them down. If you're here and say, Pastor... I don't know, but I'd sure like to know that no weapon formed against me, but I'm not a child of God. If you, everybody's it's eyes closed. It's just only me. Would you just put your hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor. I'd sure like to be one. God bless you. Thank you. Is there somebody else? God bless you, sir. Somebody else? <clears throat> couple hands. Anybody else? I, I, I sure want to be a child of God. Let me just pray this prayer. And then I, I, this is a simple prayer for you to pray. And then we're going to pray together. Father, I want to be a child of God. I want to accept what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. I want you to come into my heart. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Lord, because I don't want any weapon against me to prosper. I want to live for you. I want to live right. And I don't want to be scared of the tactics of the devil and all of his foolishness. So I accept you as the Lord of my life right now. And according to your word, I am saved. Can we give the Lord a hand for a couple people that would say, <clears throat> Adam, I want you to get ready to pray, play, sing something for me right here, if you will. But here's what I, I want to do. I want to pray for you that are facing these tactics right now. Just raise your hand if you would, if you have faced one of these isolation, insolvency, indifference. Man, hands up all over the building. As he sings right now, I just want you to lift your hands and call on the name of the Lord. And let's believe God.
with every breath that I am I may be free. Oh, I will see. I'm going to see of the goodness, goodness of God. God. He don't want you to be isolated. All my life you have been faithful. If you're a child of God, you are not isolated no matter what he says. All my life you have been so, 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 so good. good. With every breath that I am. If you're a child of God, you're not insolvent. Take your finances to the Lord and say, Lord, here they are. You are my provider. I had a good friend of mine told me this past week, he was working for a company. And the company basically said, we got to tighten it up. Or every one of us are going to be out of our job. And he said, I'm doing the very best I can. And he said, what I want you to know is this company is not my provider. I'm appreciative for the paycheck I get, but God was taking care of me before I went to work here. And God will be taking care of me when I leave here. Amen. So Father, I pray right now for those that's facing what seems to be like insolvency. There just seems to be no way, not enough, not enough money when the month is still going don't have enough assets God show us that we put it in your hand and say it ain't mine Lord it's yours God you stretch the barrel of meal you extend the life of the cruise of oil God you extend uh, the life of the gasoline or whatever it, I don't know how you're going to do it God but you are our provider and we will not be insolvent we will not be isolated. And Lord, if I'm here today and I have one inkling of an alt against my brother or my sister, I'll fix it right now. She sings this song, you feel completely at ease and comfortable to walk to anybody or to this altar and say, forgive me. I am not going to let some some crazy, insignificant tweet or post or my understanding of what you said. I'm going to fix it right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray right now for those who feel isolated, for those who feel insolvent, for those who feel indifferent. May we understand that we're not alone, that you are our supplier. You are our provider, and then it is up to us to make things right with each other. And when we do, there will be no indifference. We'll be unified, and God will be pleased. All my life, you have been faithful. 